obviously Marilyn Sklar, who is our assist assistant to Sarah Danes. This uh, program, which has been going on, I think we're in a, either the 12th or 13th year, um, is sponsored through the uh, Office of Community and Economic Development and the Tacoma Park Arts and Humanities Commission. So uh, my name is Merrill Leffler, um, and I'm going to introduce the poets tonight. Uh, you know, Tacoma Park has a lot of things going on in poetry um, over the year. I'll just mention a couple of things to begin with, that we have a favorite poem reading, which we just did the, for the 20th year. It was initiated originally when Robert Pinsky was Poet Laureate of the U.S., and we've continued doing it. We started doing it in here. We moved now to the library for the last 15 years, I think. It's a much more intimate setting. You know, we're, we don't have somebody standing up here like this and everybody else down there. We also have these poetry posters, Spring for Poetry in Tacoma Park. And these posters, these, each year we have about 30 different posters that are um, along Carroll Avenue, in the parks, at the library. If you come in the front door, you saw two posters out there uh, through the entrance. And these are uh, you know, a small group of us select the poems, and students at the uh, Montgomery College School of Art and Design are designing these posters. Um, it's not that we just hand them over, but they do designs. We give them criticism back, and it's been a terrific collaboration, and they're, you know, they're installed throughout the city. Um, you know, there's some other things that are going on. In fact, the, uh, the mayor, Mayor Kate Stewart, just proclaimed in April, uh, you know, Tacoma Park proclaiming you know, Poetry Month. I mean, it's a national thing, but there's a great deal of support and the Poet Laureateship as well. Uh, Don Berger was the first Poet Laureate, and Ann Becker, who's still carrying on uh, a monthly workshop, a free workshop, um, has been doing this for a number of years. Um, and as I said, Marilyn Sklar, Where's Marilyn? She's back here. Is responsible for this, but also coordinating this whole series. So um, we're much appreciative. You know, I can get up here to, to you know to, uh, to do the talking, but I don't do the work, the real work. I want to call your attention in the back of this program. We have a call for proposals for readers in uh, in the fall series. So um, those of you who are not reading, or you have friends, you, there's a website back here. Please post it on your Facebook page. Let, let your friends who are poets know about that we are accepting proposals for readers. You, they'll go on the website and they'll see what the requirements are. You know, it's to submit a biography and some poems and, you know, and so forth. Um, I also want to mention that we have in the city a, um, a lecture series. And on June 1st, you'll see it on the last page, there's Snake Oil Revisited, Plant Medicines in America. and. Uh, it should be pretty interesting, and other events that are going on. So if you go on to We Are Tacoma, you'll see all sorts of things that are going on in the city, um, not just in the fall and spring, but throughout the summer. Um, okay, so you all know why you're here tonight. We're going to hear four poets, uh, Mary Stone Hanley, R Ryan Holman, Samantha McGrath, and Rob Soley. Um, and you know, we're going to begin with uh, Mary, who is waiting to come up on the stage. I just want to say a few words. Um, you know, in introducing poets, it keeps me thinking about, you know, you know what, are, what are poems? Why are we writing poems? Uh, I, I've quoted on a number of occasions um, Hugh Kenner, who uh, was a literary scholar, wrote a great deal, of fabulous book on Ezra Pound called The Pound Era, and many literary essays. And in one place he said, a poem is an act of, in, uh, a poem is an act of attention that wants to compel your attention. And of course, there are many different ways, as we all know. Uh, we all write out of experience, lived experience, literary experience. And when I say lived experience, that can mean <laughs> it's a big container for everything. Your know, family history, uh, racial and gender issues, personal kinds of encounters. I mean, it could be anything. And I could make a long list, and not that these are exclusive of each other. I say this in connection introducing you know, Mary, uh, Mary Stone Hanley. Uh, I was much moved in reading her poems by a number that were inseparable, I say inseparable, from being an African American. There are poems like, and I didn't look to see which poems are in here, but there's a poem like Black Matters, it ends like this. I am the poet Mary, I write black phrases on white paper to sound that breach and reach of, those, of these black matters. 
And there are poems of homage, and you may hear some of them tonight, like um, you know, Mama Annie, who's a grandmother, let alone a small poem, which I am going to read, and even if you read it again tonight, it's called Stopped. And that's the first line of the poem, Stopped at the schoolhouse door where they squeeze the roundness of you into a black boy, square hole, not big enough to wonder in. I mean, there's this compression and it just, you know, it just reverberates and uh, releases something more than just, uh, you know, these small words. I, I mentioned to Mary that in reading her poems, I really thought of the African American, late African American poet who had been poet laureate of Maryland, but had a much of a national, if not international, reputation, Lucille Clifton. And there's a small poster here of a couple of, of Lucille's poems. Um, I say that not to uh, legitimize Mary's poems, but it's the voice, and her voice is distinctive in a way that Lucille Clifton was, that it's a strong feminine voice and a strong African American voice. And I think you're going to hear that tonight. So, very somewhere. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. you for uh, that introduction and Clifton is such a powerful voice that I am honored to uh, to f follow her trail so to speak um, the poetry that I'm writing that you're going to hear tonight are poems that come from my, well, I just finished a MFA at American University. And uh, as a thesis, we had to do a um, book of poetry. And the book of poetry is in process. Um, and I come to you totally flustered because today, for some reason, uh, Windows decided to do that little scrolling thing, and I can't, I couldn't, I couldn't print half of what I needed to print. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of a background on this book that I'm working on. It's called. Um, it's called. What did I name the um, Road Trip? That's the name of the book, Road Trip. And uh, it's, it's a road trip because, you know, the metaphor of uh, life is a trip, but uh, it's also vernacular from that period uh, of the 60s, Road Trip. And it's a road trip because my earliest memories are getting in the car with my parents and my brothers and going somewhere, anywhere. We used to drive, I, I was raised in Cleveland. We used to drive over to Akron on Sunday, see where the color folks were, hung out. That's what we did. And uh, every summer we drove somewhere. So. I'm going to share with you some of these earliest memories of road trip. Um, <clears throat> the, however, the first poem is called Homage. It's a homage to my roots. One of the things that I discovered as I was writing this, these poems is that all of my life I have focused on the blackness of me. But as I wrote these poems, what became really clear is that the class nature of my background really supports the racial nature of my background, and you find it in the poetry. So this, is, this first poem is Homage to My Roots. It's homage, but it's my homage to my roots. <clears throat> I was a weed that tangled out in my backyard with a tumble of 
yellow honey, honeysuckle, and thorny blackberries in holes my dogs dug. I bounced on Mother May I steps, waved at Miss Red, the bootlegger, who never failed to lean from her porch and ask, how was school today, baby? Next door, Mr. Swan, the numbers runner, with stingy brim fedora, wing-tipped shoes, and Gertrude, his forever yapping chihuahua, always had five dollars mama could borrow on come up short days. I swarmed on the block with friends like bees in search of a hive in cherry and mulberry trees, away from old lady Robinson, who collected any playground ball that ruffled her roses, where midnight Leroy, the howling wino, was a sober school crossing guard, where my friends slept while Miss Peach and their mothers entertained men's dreams. I sprouted on family road trips from northern ghetto to southern south, sleeping in the car because colored only mot <coughs> motels were not much better. I'm the face of surprise that peered from Miss Sharp's third grade windows, open to every black thing we wondered and more we never thought. <coughs> I am the smart aleck flounce that slowed for Mr. Newberry, the butcher who who'd tell about you acting out on the street when mama came in to pay the bill. I am Mr. Mailman H Hayden's admirer. His whistle echoed every day from porch to porch, twice on Saturday and once on Sunday during the Christmas rush. His songs danced Mr. Loomis, Mr. Pratt, <coughs> in a parade of lunch boxes, coveralls, and factory dust. I flourished like crabgrass in spite of acid rain that never cut the stench of black smoke puffed from meal stacks in rows of fat Robert Barron cigars in clouds of predictable coughs. I'm the flower of childhood sweethearts, a 10-year-old girl who got a 1920s job at Miss Ann's house and a college degree despite the depression and an angry 11-year-old boy <clears throat> on the long migration north, searching for rain and shine, 36-year job with a pension, better than shining shoes or cleaning toilets back home. They stayed together no matter what, because binding wounds and wars with wolves takes many hands and someone to guard the door. I am multitudes met and unmet, there's stories on my shoulders to give the children reach. I'm your chin up, your head down. I am lost and moving on. <coughs> All right, these are uh, a couple of these are snippets of uh, of uh, memories. <coughs> this one's called Alabama Heat, a family road trip, circa. 1956. <coughs> Excuse me. James Sr. clinches his straw fedora with calloused hands, grits his teeth and haws. Sir, he didn't know niggas come down here from the back door. We just come down here from Ohio. Ten-year-old ten Jimmy tries not to feel how the flushed necks of the men glare at him and how in his mouth the oily tobacco stains on the downturned lips of the man behind the counter taste like puke. He watches and lowers his eyes like his father. In their new Buick parked in front of the only grocery store on back roads to nowhere, wife and daughter blank blanket James's rage. Yes, sir, James Sr. steams. I'll teach him better. <coughs> North Car this was called Cousins, a family road trip, circa 1958. <clears throat> North Carolina crickets squeal with the silent rhythm of lightning bugs, the leaf chatter of Mr. Suz's cornfields, and the dust and hog smells out yonder behind the crumbling clapper shacks, cracks stuffed with newspapers, 
matching outhouse leaning with stench. Red clay yard fenced by smirking J. Crow. Inside, <coughs> single bare light bulb barely swayed by thick humid mountain air. Grown up folks slurp moonshine and slur time warm. Y'all remember whens? Bandaged in sharecropped doggedness. The scrappy radio cackles rhythms nobody can sit still to. Toes tapping, heads bobbing. Cotton escapes from steel spring grasp of the wa water-stained beige armchair chair where <clears throat> Uncle Lee and Aunt Georgia stroke each other and the blues. Their sweat hangs in clammy shadows. Cousin Letty teases. Ah, sooky, sooky, what y'all doing over there? Minding our business and leaving you in the alone. Outside, young noses press against the tattered screen door that hangs open again. Y'all don't live in no barn, slams again. <clears throat> this is my very earliest memory. <clears throat> I read it on Mother's Day because it's a really a tribute to my mother. It's called Trouble Don't Last. Inside the little house, no money for gas heat. The shrieking wind angrily rattles doors and tried to bluster through any crack of hope. A street light lit a baroque of paisley ice left by Jack the Hoarfrost on the front window. An invitation to dream tales of magic in the semi-dark room. Big brother, little brother on each side Baby sister and mama's lap huddled together. Iron, toaster, and tiny heater, defrosted feet and bodies bundled under mole hills of woolen blankets, covers, coats, and warmth wrapped in mama's stories exhaled on the wintry landscape of her breath. She lifted her hands before a light bulb and the bird silhouette frolicked on the wall. Baby girl asked, are we poor, Mama? Ah, no, child. And she pulled the children closer. Cold ain't nothing. All you got to do is rub two things together, hand to heart, pen to paper, rhythm to blues. <clears throat> One of the exciting things that I did uh, <clears throat> as a part of my MFA was a translation project. And the translation project, for some people decided to do translating of other people's poems. But <clears throat> some of us were able to translate from one art form to another. And so I translated from music, the, the music of John Col Coltrane. I translated Coltrane into, um, poetry. And so <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Coltrane has, uh, how many of you know who John Coltrane is? Okay. He has a very famous um, musical uh, piece called <sighs> A Love Supreme. And now when I wandered into this, I wandered into uh, a love supreme, really not knowing where I was going with it. There is an African phrase called Sankofa. And Sankofa means it is not taboo to go back and remember things that are forgotten. And all of these things that I lived with as a child, I had no, I, I, I really didn't understand them when I was there. And so Coltrane's A Love Supreme became a journey back into the 60s, back into myself as, uh, of, as a youth of the 60s. Uh, <clears throat> but also back into the period of the 60s. And so if you can all remember what that was like, but also Jazz music 
was a part of the transformation of society at that time. It was an avant-garde, um, and, and the avant-garde that connected to the black arts movement. Uh, so, so there are deep connections that uh, resonate even now. And so, uh, <clears throat> so anyway, so um, I Love Supreme has four suites in it. Um, and uh, uh, the four suites are acknowledged, never mind, I don't need to go on all that, but pursuance is one of them. And pursuance is just what it sounds like. If you listen to it, there is, most of it is this, it, it sounds like someone is running really, really hard. I mean, running, running, and it's chaos and running, and then all of a sudden it ends in silence, in the silence of a stand-up uh, bass, just the silence of a sun, and it's very quiet, and that's how it ends. Bing. Okay, so this is a little, my in poetic interpretation of pursuance, and it starts with a quote from Coltrane, no road, is an easy one, but they all go back to God. <coughs> Pursuance. Run, black man. How fast through the fire, how hot the bashing and bombing before you burn. Run, that one there makes black stories into lies to flog your dignity. Run, that one, stiff arms, stretched out claws reaches to grab and possess, he thinks he owns you, can name you, treat you however he likes. Run, run, black man, out that degrading back door, round his, this forest bend, down hi history on that red dirt road, through the death shadows in the woods, up from that ditch, over that wall, the w that one conflagrates everywhere, won't hesitate to kill children in church or rice patties, drags his dogs to frighten what scares the bejesus out of him, hoping he can cage what he can't stop. Run! He thinks he sets the pace, but you the one that leads and he follows. You to the shelter of the old rhythms where people know the low down and the get up of the blues, how to haul the work song till the job gets done. Make a way out of nothing from their forward boogie stride, hipping down hostile back alleys, hopping over yesterday's hot ashes on Main Street. Run, black man, run! Lure him into the cool known rivers where the vibe is deep and the jazz is free, where the peaceful pulse returns. Sit together and break wisdom. He lost his way. Give it back to him. Take him home. And then last, there are a bunch of others in here. I hope it's the last. Um, the, the book proceeds through my youth and my activism of, of my early 20s, um, and I'm not going to go into that, because like, we only had 15 minutes. Um, but <clears throat> I'm hoping I can find in my, um, This one is uh, the poem that ends the book. Um, it's called Woman's Home. Mama dropped joy in the stash behind the secondhand chest of drawers that smelled of elbow grease. Woman's got to have her own, she said. Her conspiratorial wink invited me to grown folks business. Our mothers, mothers, mothers wrapped me in generous generations, rocked me with wisdom. <clears throat> know when you hold a lightning bug or a housefly with a mesmerizing lamp on its tail. Change your raggedy mind before you go out. Life's full of accidents. 
Always carry some spare light in your purse so you can get home. But just in case, I'll leave some love in the window for you. There's fixings on the stove. Help yourself to the mix. Taste your strength, daughter. Add your own verbs and spices. Memories are on the top shelf. But take care. Kitchens can swelter. Still the world craves the stew you make and needs the sweat you scatter. It's coming. <laughs> well, thank you, Mary. Good start for, you know, for us this evening. Um, you know, I, I think I mentioned that uh, you know, a couple of these poets, I hadn't read their work before. So, um, and when I do read somebody whose work I haven't read, there's, it's always, there's always going to be something, at least I've found, that jumps out at me or that uh, kind of center of gravity. Um, it may be something else for, you know, for somebody else, but you know, reading those, those poems. But when I read some of Ryan's poems um, you know, for the first time, uh, what struck me was the imagery and the kind of precision of language. Um, now that's a general term, so I'll just give you one example. Um, a poem called, in fact, is this one? You have August and Pearl. Uh, yeah, so this was, <laughs> I, I hadn't seen this before tonight, so this, was from, this is from August. So it'll give you something as a kind of uh, entry um, in some sense, or you may disagree with it. But the, um, it's about this miserable, humid heat, which we you know, have right now, and this is called August, but we have it here in, in May. Um, and so here's how the first stanza goes. We closed our eyes and walked across the bright red coals, biting our lips, trying not to scream, and now steam rises off our bodies in aloof, sticky clouds. Now, if you just listen to that and, and read it again, there are these... Poets sometimes, you know, poems sometimes have to lie to tell the truth. You have to use hyperbole. You have to use, you know, something to evoke. When I said before about compelling your attention, um, actually, you, uh, Hugh Kenner had said that poems try to evoke your attention. I, to me, it's more compelling, uh, compel our attention. But the bright red coals, well, you know, it's the poet going off and walking on these hot coals, but it's that sense of, that feel of. And the same thing with, you know, steam rises off our bodies in not just sticky clouds, but aloof sticky clouds. So there's this, that's what I meant by precision of language. There's a level of detail which uh, is very striking. Um, and, then, you know, there's another poem, um, what is it called? Um, I don't have the title. But, but where the, there is this analogy, the poem is built on the analogy between, you know, making strong paper and making strong bodies. Is this wonderful kind of leap? Um, and so, oh yeah, the poem is called Washi. I don't know if you're going to read that tonight, but okay. Um, I don't have it up here, or else I would. So I just was reading this little bio piece here, and um, and it and it ends. And she enjoys writing about every day. I, I left off, you know, leaving graduate school, which can enhance, you know, could really squash one's creativity, having been there myself. And um, she says she enjoys writing about every day and fantastic life through the lens of the elements. And it's that fantastic element that uh, struck me um, in my, at least my first reaction to the poem. So now we'll hear them. And welcome, Brian Holman. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Um, I, and I, 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 I like how um, 
there, you highlighted two of the very different poems, and I hope that some of the poems that I'm reading tonight um, encompass some of the variety of the things that I have been known to notice and write about. Um, my first one that I want to share with you tonight is actually called April, and it's kind of a partner to the poem August, which I will read in a little bit. And April goes like this. We scurried through the rain and crossed the tracks fast to beat the oncoming light. You seemed to know where we were going, even though we'd never come this way. We walked past the post office and were swallowed by the neighborhood. The train and the traffic whooshed by, unseen behind the trees. Up ahead, a barn-like building materialized from the drizzle. It sat on an island, candy-coated yellow, surrounded by gray streets. It was closed that day, but inside was a wealth of small paper treasures for small chubby children. Hop on Pop, Good Night Moon, a disnified version of Hansel and Gretel. Which was your favorite story, I asked, as we walked on in the mist. I don't know, you said. I've always been a fan of making my own. My next poem is the, the one that Merrill, uh, one of the ones that Merrill quoted from in the introduction. Uh, and this one is called August, and it sort of goes with April, although it was not written with it um, at the time. This is August. We closed our eyes and walked across the bright red coals, biting our lips, trying not to scream, and now steam rises off our bodies in aloof, sticky clouds. We've been defiant, denying the heat, until the wavering haze settled in, heavy and wet, and pushed the dust down with the air in our lungs. With sand and soot between our toes, we shield our eyes from the sun and stick to the oxblood leather sofa, feeling the oppressive air spread through the room like magma in a way that makes even the birds quiet to a stony silence. You ask me, as you look through the dying sunbeams with your head in my lap, what now? Having written about air and fire, I kind of wanted to follow it with a poem about water. And this is actually a fairly recent work. And I call it Dowser. One of my maternal relatives made his living finding water and ending droughts. I wonder if water is as thick as his blood. I travel places that only get rain one week a year and come home with mud in my clothes. Red outback sand becomes red outback mud everywhere. California ash turns hillsides brown with miniature rapids. Colorado flat iron dust settles in and sucks at my boots as we struggle forward and the dog seeks higher ground. Sand to mud. Ashes to mud, dust to mud. Perhaps as I wander, instead of a clarion call, I should be listening for a squish. So I write a lot about things that I know very intimately, and I also write about things that I know well, but at the same time can wonder about things beyond the current world, the current moment. And this poem actually was written for the Baltimore Science Fiction Society's contest last year. And it's called Pearl. The pig roots up the shiny bauble from the end of her rope. Her handlers are surprised. Usually she finds coal-colored truffles if she finds anything at all. It isn't the object of their search. The pig handler scolds the pig and jerks on the rope. His partner pockets the find in silence. 
Later that night, after the campfire is embers, and even the pig snores softly, the partner reaches into his pocket and pulls out the treasure. It has been centuries since anyone has seen metal work so finely with little pinprick holes and a stem at the top. Such is the stuff of storybooks. It twists apart easily, but only by a finger's breadth to reveal a shiny metal cylinder that winks in the starlight, but is otherwise inert. Perhaps, as his brother thinks, it is junk. He douses the embers, goes back to his bedroll, drops the shiny bauble by the tent flaps. From deep within the metal, from deep within the metal, a bright magnesium spark kindles, grows infinitely fast. Bright light expands over the camp and the landscape and up into the night sky, then fades to dark and leaves behind a coal-colored truffle. Far out in space from the pinprick stars, they see the brilliant flash of light for the first time in centuries. It is a signal foretold by prophecy. It is time to reclaim the home world. So coming back to Earth a little bit, um, a lot of what has driven my poetry lately, and I suspect this is true for a lot of artists, um, is a lot of what is going on and what we see in the, both in the news and from our friends and from the news cycle that kind of surrounds us and wants to be a blanket. We're not sure how comfortable said blanket is, but it is a blanket. Um, and you find out a lot of different things about your friends that you might not have otherwise known, thanks to the internet. Um, some of it's good, some of it's not so good, but all of it is illustrative regardless. And this is about that, and I call it the Caffeine and Moonlight Society. After the sun goes down, they emerge from the shadows and soak up the blue glow. By day, they are quotidian people, editors, engineers, EMTs. But by night, they don their avatars. Previous centuries had Locke and Rousseau, or spectators and tattlers. They claim to have Quora and Reddit. They seek, as others, to tell the story to make their voice the one heard in the narrative when later scholars seek archives. They are powered by coffee and tea spiked with righteous indignation and other heady herbs. The shadows of the wee hours grow long and ebb as the eastern sky is lit aflame with a new day. They slink into their shadows and their dens to sleep until the alarm sound to signal the return of another day. Children are awakened and cared for. Dogs need to be walked and fed. Partners need to be hurried out to work. The wheel of the day turns. The world continues on, and they watch and wait. The night comes again, and the blue glow intensifies in the dark, and the avatars meet once more. The war for history will not be won by weapons alone. It will be won by wits. that idea of a war for history became very clear um, several nights in the last, oh, call it decade. Um, and I actually am going to share with you all a slightly older piece that I wrote, but I thought of it again much more recently. And the piece was originally written on election night of 2008. And I thought of it again on election night of 2016 because it seemed that things were very different, but in other ways, things sort of remain the same. And so I will share this with you tonight. And it's called Purple People. 
we pee on the collective stick and we wait. Some people say we're long overdue and finally we decide to find out for sure. There's lots of talk, but in the end it all comes down to a wait. What will the future bring? Conflicting visions dance in our heads of doctors, of judges, of change, of family values, of reputations, of ruin, of battles yet to be fought. Are we ready, no matter the outcome? Can we support ourselves with someone new on the way? Will it be good news or bad, and will we know the difference? We know what others want for us, we know what we want, and we pray that fate will agree. And when we see the final lines, we weep. Some with joy, others with relief, and still others with fear and wonder that God would punish them so. Related somewhat to that, um, I will read my final poem that I re was more recent. Um, it was actually written in the extraordinarily long line for the women's room outside of Gate C-27 at Dulles Airport on January 20th of this year. Um, there were a lot of people coming in for some strange reason. They were all wearing pink hats that were rather distinctive. Um, and so when the plane landed, they all came off of the plane en masse, and of course what everyone does when they come off of a plane after a long flight is they form a queue outside of that particular room. And while I was standing there, some, someone was commenting on this and was going, I was wondering why this was so long, and then I remembered why we were flying here. So this poem is called You in the Pink. Rose magenta. Claim, reclaim the color once exclusively used for boys. Defy the blues. Fuchsia, coral, protect what you value. You are the reminder that pussies have teeth. We stand at the intersection. Obstacles to the left, barriers to the right. The only viable way is forward. Wear pink as war paint, not as blush, but as granite, as quartz, polished or rough, fearless of the blustering storm. We are good enough because we make good on our promises to rise up and be counted. Like our sisters who came before, make great America again. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, so next we have Samantha, Samantha McGrath. Um, also whose poems I you know, read for the first time. And the first poem I read was Siren, which, are you gonna read that tonight? You're not gonna read Siren, okay. Well, I'll just say something about Siren. It, you know, a simple poem in which the poet thinks, um, how did they get the same name? The fi you know, how did they get the same name? The fire engines wail and the voice I used to call you down into the water. So um, neither the poet nor the poem gives us the answer to that, but it evokes a sensual, and, and really, um, in, in this one poem at any rate, a kind of erotic feel for the siren capitalist, not of the uh, fire engines. Um, I think one of the striking things, again, for, you know, for me, was the, you know, the imagery. You know, there's an old, of course, me, something from the 18th century Alexander Pope said, uh, what is poetry? Um, now it just escapes my mind about uh, what oft was said, but ne'er so well expressed. And so it's seeing the common, but in a new way, or ways that are surprising. And so here's just one, you know, a couple of small stanzas from a poem called Summer's Fall. At wood's edge, 
and upholstery of vines has smoothed the bushes into furniture. It makes us see why they're so common to us in a wholly different way, and yet it's before us. And I, that's one of the things that poems and poets do. The cicadas are busy at their sewing machine, stitching us together in short bursts. You know, cicadas and sewing machines, and it's just a kind of natural. You know, there's wholly unrelated. Um, there's a wonderful uh, you know, statement by um, what is a 19th century revolutionary who says about uh, re your, uh, 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 revolution that in the beginning it seems impossible. When it you know it seems impossible, but when it happens, it seems inevitable. And so these images that strike us uh, as unique, they, they, become, they become natural. So you may not look at hedges in the same way again. <laughs> any rate, Samantha, please. Thank you, Merrill. And uh, thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. Um, the first thing I'm going to read is uh, something I wrote at the very, very end of last year, probably December 27th, last few days of the year. And uh, I don't know if you remember 2016, but uh, every famous person that we love died, and then we had the election. So this is a, it's called A Prayer for the End of 2016, and I was trying to sort of get the collective feeling. Here, when what is left of the year is slight, now that it has stopped hemorrhaging light and stands still, gathering itself for a fresh start, you crumple the dough that has already had all the stars and trees that would fit cut out of it, and roll it out again plain, sweet but dwindling. Here, let nothing happen, though the Christmas tree is brittle enough to use for kindling, let it diminish, diminish, diminish. Tuck the last scraps into the cutter, Nothing left over, biscuit brown and uniced. Quietly, quietly, let it finish. Since that one's unseasonal already, I, the next two are about fall. This one is the one that Merrill referred to, summer's fall. At wood's edge, an upholstery of vines has smoothed the bushes into furniture. Great herds of clouds are migrating across the sky. The cicadas are busy at their sewing machine, stitching us together in short bursts, working to finish the quilt of us by winter. Already the woodbine lies on the hedges like snow. The heat has tacked us in place for the cicadas seeming. Don't move, I whisper to you. Each rise and fall of their song, one meditative breath. A frieze of wedgewood blue shadows crawls on the white wall painted cream by the late light. The sun hangs on by its nails its reluctance bruising the sky. The title from this one comes from something my grandmother used to say. That'll all come right in the end, you'll see. And you might hear her say this when she's seeing the start of the Iraq war on television, for example. And it was uh, half optimism and half denial. That'll all come right in the end, you'll see. I went to the garden seeking a certain collapse, fallen asters shot through with dried seed pods. It was too early in the autumn. I walked slowly because I felt my grandmother with me, and in one spot I smelled her coal fire that burned all summer. I wondered if you were ready to take custody of this heart. At the rim of the lake I sat drinking tea from a thermos while a suspended frog regarded me through golden eyes. Blessings piled up, a hawk and a wren, a chipmunk crossed my path. I passed the wedding at the moment of the kiss. Here were the asters upright, brimming with honeybees and punctuated by a monarch posing like a stained glass window. Their collapse, too, bad news they hadn't heard. How I pass the time on my island. Pirates and armadas have come. I have looted, stripping them of every message carried in secret pockets or scrolled into green glass bottles. I released their parrots, broadcasting them over the ocean in search of olive branches. 
I have a collection of medals pinned to palm trees for bravery in the face of hurricanes. I have confused their maps with so many X's, my patient calligraphy marking a world brimming with treasure. I have turned men into pigs and sent them plunging over my cliffs. I repaired their vessels, sewing sails from my pristine white nightgowns from eyelet lace. Spinning sailors through every compass point, I shoved them dizzy to their homes on other shores. Now I wait for the next man to run aground on my shipwreck hips. Manna. I am Red Riding Hood, raised by wolves. I walk through the forest in velvet cloak over breadcrumbed ground. I stalk through the forest, past fairy mounds, under rowan and oak. I pillow on a wasp's nest, sleep naked on moss while ants file around me. I sleep encircled by breadcrumbs. I sleep in a fairy ring, wrapped in red. In all these places I dream of wishing wells, still pools, of a path in a stream, wake with dew in my bed, walk as if antlered, never speak, bearing messages between my mother and my grandmother. I hear owls singing. I don't need any other, eat breadcrumbs and wild onions, drink kissing the stream, tell the magic places by their thorns. Eventually I come across all I seek. When I meet a man with an ax who wants to cut me down, I lure him, flitting tree to tree, red and pale, red and pale, and drown him in my woods. This next one I put here because it's uh, quite a contrast to the last one. So It's called Modern Woman. I indulge myself in slick competencies, quick press of a plastic card to machine, and barriers slide away to let me enter. Metro hums fluorescent underground. People scry their phones, one ear on garbled announcements to time themselves through the doors. My footsteps sound on hard surfaces, crisp and regular as a dealer laying down card after card on the city's table. Walls create an illusion of solitude. I walk feet away from where invisible people lie sleeping. We're as close as refugees. At his building, he buzzes me up. I ascend in a metal box, let myself in, strip at bedside and slip naked into the thread count to be his wilderness. Despite. Despite your cat-killing misogyny, your witch-burning sex, the vodka glitter in your eyes, despite your vampire fidelity and the blank stare of your bare chest, the smudges of your black love polluting my neck, I have you inextricably confused with my mother, my old mistake, like a strange and consistent misspelling, my algebraic heartbreak. This one is about a first date, and uh, if you were listening to the last one, you can imagine how well that's going to go. <laughs> it's called Tense. My past is as much a mystery to me as my future. What was I thinking? Why did I agree to this? We meet in a tea house hung with empty bird cages. I don't know whether the birds have gotten free or haven't been caught yet, and so I don't know if what you're saying is a promise or a threat. I eat grapes to prevent wine so that the sober world can click through its months like a rosary in prayer or penance. Who knows what you do with your time? Maybe you're working against me. I am trying to mind my own business here on this date with you. When I breathe in, I'm imagining shifting in ornate cages, imagining birds. When I breathe out, they explode through the windows and flock in the sky. The tea pours in an amber arc, drowning out your words. Look, let me be honest, this can never work. Even as I sit here with you, my own blood erodes my heart. Then, just to be cheery, I have a series of poems on uh, leaving and being left. Uh, this one is called Things I Never Did because there are three uh, similes in here, things I've never done. Things I never did. Being with you was like getting a long tattoo, tedious pain, your pen in my skin, 
something I couldn't see spreading its wings on my back. When it was finished and you were gone, there it was drawn out forever, beads of blood and then healed, ink sealed just under the surface. Being with you was like a tandem skydive strapped to a stranger I was counting on to bring me safely to ground which I had been foolish enough to leave. I was all fear and you all business. My once, your hundreds of times. I arched against you in ecstasy in this strange intimacy of falling and floating. Then we stumbled back onto our own feet and you walked away. Being with you was like huddling in a doorway during an earthquake. You held me on the threshold while the world retched and rearranged itself. Braced in that frame, I wondered if you would come inside or if I would go out into that new landscape. But when everything was still, we just closed the door and found ourselves on different sides of it. Me and my den, and you mixed back into everything where I would never find you again. Evidence. The last time you saw me was on the security cam footage, unmistakable, though the image didn't move like me. Moments jumped together like I was already losing time, face blank without the feelings I put there for you, alone. The escalator took me down and out of range. You waited, but I didn't resurface on any other camera. I'd slipped into a wilderness of unmonitored streets, stopped making purchases, come unmoored from my phone. Some Hades has me hidden away. All you have is a stuttered dubstep glide onto the escalator, a ghost already. In your dreams now, I move like that, make love to you like that, blank-faced, somehow never taking off the black dress I wore the day I left, when I was taken. You play back the smoother footage of those last days you store in your memory, scanning for missed clues. In your uneasy sleep, I'm always at a remove. Behind a robotic lens, I lag. You can't convince the people in uniforms there's been any crime. They sit at laminate tables with you and watch me board the escalator again and again. You grasp at straws and they look at each other while you look at the screen. The footage clearly shows me descending, facing away from you and never looking back. On the possibility of saving them. They drown beneath you, they drown reaching for your eyes with theirs, beseeching their pain in their throats. You want to save every one. They just drown in your arms, and then they put their clothes back on and say they'll call, as if you hadn't seen them sink, as if you hadn't failed. You desperately want to drag just one up onto the sand, vomiting amniotic fluid and staggering to his feet, instead of relinquishing their dead weights, instead of turning from their salt-glazed gazes, as they button up their blue shirts and lie. This is the most recent one that I've written. It's called Sweetheart. My chest is a hive. For a century, the bees have been building in the chambers of my heart, and now it is all wax and hexagons. A century of industry, drinking from God knows what dark blossoms. 100 years carrying their buzzings and stirrings, their arcane dancing, their soft gray larva. I am suffused with honey, bloodless. I wait until you're gone. Alone in my room, I slit a vein on every limb, slowly oozing sweetness. A bee emerges from each fingertip. Bees fly out of the palms of my hands. Black bees halo me angrily. I lie limp in amber, a few insects nursing fitfully at the flowers on my summer dress. Someone said I was sweet and I wrote that. May have, may have been a little overreaction there. This is the last one. I'm sure you're relieved. These men. Now I am finished with these men who have cried out to me in a pitch that normal women cannot hear fevered, call for love, and shrink from love in fear. I didn't manage to save a single one looking back on my career. Although I did all that I could, after all their bullshit, there I stood. No anniversary to show for my 20 years. I arrived breathless and unchaperoned at middle age, without propriety's dull gleam. 
no pension plan, no widowhood, no matter. My heart intact, I ride my borders, acres of ripped out seams. These men, they're like keys I've lost the locks to. They're like things I photograph in dreams. Thank you. I did speak of striking imagery, right? <laughs> to say the least. Um, thank you, Samantha. So we're going to conclude with Rob Soley. Um, you know, in looking at the program that um, you know that Marilyn put together, there are two poems that you know that I know, and they reflect, I think, uh, at least of Rob's work that I know. Rob has read in the series before, and then I had some poems from him today. Um, plus the ones that I knew from before. There are these poems that, like this first one, The Task at Hand, which you know, are poems of observing and the sense of gratitude, that sense of acknowledgement of the small things that, that go on, as so many poems do. Then there's that other, there's, there are those other poems that are sensual, erotic, uh, and affirming, and, um, but in a very sensual way. So we may hear some of those tonight. We'll see. Uh, Rob Soli. Thank you, Merle. Um, I've had the good fortune in my life to be married twice to two good women. <laughs> and the first one tragically uh, died of cancer after 22 years. And I kind of thought that was it. You know, I had my 22 years. Most people don't get that much. And then uh, fell in love again, uh, which totally surprised me, shocked me. Uh, and over the last 20 years, I've written some poems that I would say celebrate uh, middle-aged love. Uh, and which doesn't get much press, you know. Uh, so um, they kind of evolved. And so this, several of these, this is what they come from. The first one's called Why I Will Not Get Out of Bed. It's her body again, the soft sacrament of her skin that consecrates this ordinary morning. Her full naked stretch that dissolves my resolve to rise. Even with the cat scratch at the door and the radio alarm's rising volume, I find myself wanting only one thing, to rub our middle-aged frames together. I have not been lonely much in my life, nor have I been alone for very long. For three years after my first wife died, I scrambled out of bed and quickly refitted the elastic corners of the bottom sheet, carefully smoothed and tucked the top sheet, then centered the quilt so that the edges evenly hung an inch above the floor. I knew that bed would stay made all day. Now, every day, the sheets are clumps of wrinkled flowers. A mountainous quilt ranges across the bottom of the bed, and the pillows are downy tufts of abstract sculpture. None of it matters. I am a man with my woman in bed. I will lie here and lie here, stroke and be stroked. And sometime later I will arise with sensual sleep still in my eyes and laugh at the tough, tousled existence my life has become. So there's several of these poems. That one's called Why I Will Not Get Out Why I Will Not Get Out of Bed. This one's called Why We Missed Mass. Today we are Adam and Eve, and we glory in our naked innocence transformed from separate flesh and blood into euphoric union. We stroke the sweet softness of our Sabbath bodies, remembering to keep it holy, as incense rises in praise from the smoldering flames of the fire we've kindled. Soft mounds and hardened muscles brush against each other, and as our legs intertwine, we create and are created, clothed only in this erotic moment. Even after 19 years, something new is born, deep in our souls and loins, as we are moved to ecstatic utterance, 
the secret language of humans and angels. Why we missed the last 10 minutes of the Women's World Cup semifinal. I followed the sensations in my fingers as they brushed against the silken skin of your bare thigh, felt it pulse through my arms and the rest of my body, and our eyes changed to that soft smoldering look that told us both we were done watching the game, even though I was really into it. So I let go and surrendered to the moment, redirecting my passions into the delightful erotic task at hand, right there on the couch. We never even turned off the set or minded the dog who simply curled up into his bed and sighed. Eventually, all our clothes lay strewn around the living room and we lay blissfully together like two teens who for the first time had tasted forbidden fruit, except this time was somewhere in the thousands for us and there were no parents to watch, to watch for, no kids to be worried about that might wake up, just the two of us on our sofa and our not-so-empty nest. Q&A. Sometimes it's a slow, quiet tumble into the center of our beings, beginning with feathery strokes on the so-soft underside of her breast, as we drift into that space between awake and asleep, and my unhurried hands silently pose a question and her unhurried hands silently offer the answer. One of the challenges and also the gifts to uh, of long-term relationship is holding the sorrows together uh, of growing older. And this poem's called Whispered Sorrows. Whispered sorrows in the early morning light, your heart of sadness opens to mine. Father, nearly 91, grown small and frail. Mother, continuing to slip from the edge of here and now into a sea of lost memories. Our beloved dog, finally acting his old age. In hushed voices, we weave a nest of words for these griefs to rest in as we nestle in the comfort of our blessed bed, a thin sheet between us and the outside world. I was raised Catholic and um, I don't know if, if, if you've been raised Catholic, you kind of, it's sort of like being in the mob. Uh, you can't really get out. Uh, and I find that uh, my Catholicism kind of pokes through whether I like it or not at times um, in kind of odd places. This one, this poem's called Communion. Cloaked in the priestly garb of the food warehouse worker, black pants, white shirt, blue apron, a blue cap over a thin mesh hairnet, rubber gloves and dangling name tag that tells me it's Darlene tucked behind her tiny aluminum altar. There she prepares the gifts for the hungry masses who stream past her in droves, casting casual but reverent glances at her, knowing that she has not to be approached until preparation is complete. She methodically lines up the white paper cupcake holders in several symmetrical rows across the red plastic tray, then begins the meticulous task of swabbing each gluten-free cracker with an ample portion of organic grape jelly, all without the aid of any white-robed acolytes. Bread and wine merge together into one nourishing bite. Finally, the moment of invitation. The quietly consecrated offering is ready, and we are welcomed with the words of institution, giving a clear description of what each of us is about to receive. So we all flock to listen and partake of the blessed contents, their origin, and of course, their cost. I'm a Reiki practitioner, 
and uh, I don't know how most of you may have heard of Reiki at least and know about it. Yeah, and I uh, started volunteering with hospice, and I, I, I there's one woman I um, treat who's uh, 99 years old, and she, but she's had dementia for 15 years, and um, actually it's been. She's going to be 100 in June, and I started treating her before she turned 99. I don't think she knows she's in hospice. <laughs> but so this is from that experience. It's called, Do You Want to Be in a Poem? Where does one go with dementia? I don't know. But apparently that's where she's been this last 15 of her 99 years on this earth. And here she is before me, bundled into her wheelchair, Afternoon sun streaming through the window lights up her sleeping frame. Her hands rested on a brown formica over the bed table. So I rest mine on hers and begin an improvised Reiki treatment and watch for her eyes to open, which they do. Two bright blue lakes amidst the weathered map of her face. As I follow the thin broken line her conversation travels along, we exchange unconnected phrases like sudden billboards popping up by the side of the road. It's good, she tells me, and I agree, yes it is, followed by a sleepy silence. Then, that's excellent, as I place my hand on her shoulder, then agree with a simple yes and another nod as we hold our gaze. After several other exchanges, my own surprising phrase arises and poses a question to her as we continue our journey. Do you want to be in a poem? To which she simply nods, of course. And so here she is. Sometimes uh, I've written a poem that I'm not sure at all what it's about until after I've written it and then read it a few times. And uh, I think this is about our times that have been referred to, the, the current times. It's called Daffodils in the Dark. This time feels different. The icy atmospheric flows have already turned the spring blooms dirty brown. The turtles at the lake have gone back into hiding. The Canada geese seem to squawk their wonderings that maybe they did not go far enough south to avoid this new deadlier chill. So this evening I find myself bundled up in my backyard, scissors and flashlight in hand, cutting daffodils in the dark in hopes of extending their lives for a few more days. And as I cut them, I speak to them in quiet mournful tones and gently lay them in a pile. When I finish my work, I gather them up, take them inside, arrange them in a vase, and place their yellow brilliance against the darkened window. The uh, poem that uh, Merle referred to, The Task at Hand, which is a snapshot, uh, was actually written, we were uh, in Toronto and I was at a traffic light, you know, for about a minute and got to see this happening with uh, what looked like a grandfather and grandchild. Uh, which reminds me of the uh, hundreds, thousands, millions of ordinary, extraordinary things that go on through the day of, of love and care. The task at hand. Paused in the middle of a city sidewalk, he bends to balance his slumped over sleeping grandchild against the striped canvas back of an old umbrella stroller. Both the grandfather and the stroller have seen better days, and yet he is so utterly focused on his work he takes no notice of the noonday traffic nor the lunchtime crowd streaming past as he tenderly cradles the child's head in his brown weathered hands, and for one small moment, they become a tiny island of nurturing quiet amidst the noisy urban surf. I actually kind of lost track of the time. Are we getting 
sort of a couple more, one more, one more, one more. <laughs> this is a prayer for everyday encounters, which I wrote or started writing when I was kind of driving through a parking lot with um, uh, Home Depot and very busy place. Prayer for everyday encounters. For today, help me drive through crowded parking lots. Stop, wave, and allow everyone to cross before me. Delight when they wave back and assume all those who don't are waving a quick thank you in their hearts. For today, let me listen patiently as the nerdy cashier at the hardware store invokes a past conversation and tells me again about the relevance of 1984 and how we are all moving dangerously toward an Orwellian society. For today, for today, enable me to gracefully sit for an extra minute at a crosswalk as a parade of young teens banter their way off the bus, absolutely ignore me, and cross the street at whatever the opposite of the speed of light is. For today, give me the grace to forgive every shopper that slowly walks through the low-cost warehouse store beside, not behind their carts, talking on their cell phones and stopping in the middle of the aisle for free samples. And lastly, for today, allow me to forgive myself when I run out of patience and think, oh my God, son of a bitch, you pain in the ass. Would you please notice I am here, say excuse me, and kindly get the hell out of my way. Thank you.